Hi, this is Mike Sandoval with Muse, and we're here for our first interview of 2013 with one of the greatest guitar players of our generation, Wayne Kramer. Hi, hey, how's it going today? It's going well, thanks. Nice to be here with you, Mike. Hey, thanks. I uh, wanted to just start off today, um, you're being featured as one of the great guitarists here at the Grammy Museum in downtown LA. And I um, want to see how you get, how did you get your start and um, how did your music evolve eventually to even co come into co-found MTT5? Well, um, I, I came up in uh, the 50s, I was a boy in the 50s and rock and roll was really just emerging, especially rock music that featured the electric guitar. And Chuck Berry was a new artist in those days, and he had this song um, that was played on the radio called Johnny Be Good. And in the song, it told the story of a, a boy who learned how to play his guitar really well, almost like ringing a bell, and that um, he became very popular, and people would come from all over to watch him play his guitar at night. And I was just intrigued with that lyric. I thought, that's how I want my life to go. So I started studying the guitar and learning from other musicians and taking lessons. And, and uh, you know, once you make that kind of total commitment to something um, when you're young, um, you, you can pretty much achieve it <laughs> if you make a total commitment. Uh, so Chuck Berry is one of your influences. Who else influenced you growing up? Uh... Well, I was influenced by the rock musicians, my contemporaries in the 60s, you know, the British bands, the uh, uh, Rolling Stones and the Beatles, and, and more in particular uh, Jeff Beck and uh, Jimmy Page. Um, I really, Eric Clapton, I listened to those guys a lot. Uh, and I was also, but all, the, all that rock music kind of only took me so far. And I started to discover um, the free jazz movement, uh, the music of John Coltrane and Archie Shepp and Pharoah Sanders. And what I heard was that like all the rock guys could take the guitar so far, but they couldn't go any further with it. But the free jazz guys could go further. So I wanted to go further too. So I kind of used them as my guide, you know, that there was a way to go farther with the guitar and, and bring the guitar into a whole new way of approaching music. I, 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 think, I think that's my story. <laughs> So how did MC5 start up? How did that all come about? And Because uh, you're a very popular band in the 60s, 70s, and uh, then it just stopped. Uh, what happened? What occurred? Sure. Well, I started the band um, because uh, I found it easier to start my own band than to um, join somebody else's band. <laughs> I was a little younger than a lot of the, the guys in the scene in those days, so when I would go to auditions, um, almost everybody could play better than I could. So I said, you know, this ain't working, I, I should start my own band. So I found guys in school that wanted to be in a band with me, and, and, and that e evolved into the MC5. And the MC5, um, I, I think we, we tried to be true to the idea of the limitless possibilities that music and and art itself represent and uh, you know the possibility of a new kind of music the possibility of a new kind of lifestyle the possibility of a new kind of politics uh, and I think we we made some strong statements um, I think that we uh, accomplished what we set out to do but um, ultimately, the MC5 imploded. Uh, you know, the arc of a band, it's, like all things in nature, it's conceived, it's birthed, it's nourished, it grows, it flourishes, it matures, and then it withers and dies. That's what happens to most bands, and that, that's what happened to the MC5. Um, the MC5 also had um, great political pressure on it. Um, there were a lot of people in the establishment, uh, prosecutors, uh, uh, FBI, who didn't like the things that we talked about and um, vowed to suppress us and in fact did. 
your band was the prototype for a lot of punk rock and heavy metal music that would come in the future. Iggy and the Stooges. I mean, The Clash wrote a song about you. Uh, how do you think that after the, the troubles that you had gone through, going to jail for two years, and then seeing all that resurgence of what things that you've touched become into something to, to affect other people, how did that feel? How did that affect you? Anyway? It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been waiting for? <laughs> been telling you all along. <laughs> Um, no, listen, uh, you know, it, it's a, a unexpected honor and it's very humbling to, to go out and play MC5 songs for thousands of, of fans. You know, I've played them uh, at the Reading Festival in England, uh, you know, for 60,000 kids who all knew the lyrics to the songs. I mean, we weren't that big back in the day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's humbling and in a way it's gratifying to know that um, you, you created something that um, has endured over time. And, uh, and it's inspiring to, you know, to, for me to continue on. And today for the, at the Grand Museum, they're going to show a little uh, short, brief documentary on you, and especially your nonprofit, uh, which is a uh, guitar, was it uh, Jail Guitars Doors in the USA? And talk a little bit more about your nonprofit and what you do and sure. how it all was formed. Sure. Well, you know, most people in the white community. Uh, they might have a distant cousin that went to prison or a bad uncle somewhere. People in the brown community and the black community all, all have many people in their families that are caught up in the prison systems. Um, so part of my job is to talk about this and to, to uh, put a light on it and show that uh, there's something going on in America that's wrong. It's just wrong. It's unjust and it's unfair and it falls on um, mostly people of limited economic means and people of color. And um, it, it, it goes against everything that we think that our country should stand for, which is justice and fairness. And uh, so I, I kind of see part of my job as to get a conversation going about the fact that we have two and a half million people in prison in America. And I'm, I'm um, for safe streets, I'm for public safety, I believe in the rule of law, but I think the punishment should fit the crime. And to lock people up for decades for marijuana is not justice. To lock people up for 10, 20, 30 years for minor nonviolent offenses is not justice. So I want to talk about that, I, I want to put some light on it, and then uh, on a people helping people level, um, I want to help those people that are uh, under lock and key, because those are our brothers and sisters, those are our neighbors, and 95% of the people that are in prison today are going to come home someday and they're going to live next door to you and me. And so if we don't do something to help them become better people and change for the better while we have them in custody, they are guaranteed to come out worse. And then we end up not only not safer, we end up less safe. So it's on us to do something about it. As much as I love Barack Obama, I don't expect Barack to do this. I think we need to do this. I think me and you need to do it. I think the people out there that are listening to this, they need to get involved because it's in our own interest. Well, thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, really appreciate meeting with us uh, today and look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you.